Okay, folks, here's something you probably didn't see coming. Night Thrasher versus Isom. Why Night Thrasher versus Isom? Well, I happened to see a comment bashing Isom number one, and it basically said that Marvel's latest release, Night Thrasher number one, is a hundred times better than Isom number one. So I thought, huh. I know people are always look, uh, asking me to look into Marvel Comics and DC Comics now and then. Maybe I'll go and take a look at this. So uh, I decided to take a look at Night Thrasher number one. Now, I am familiar with the character of Night Thrasher because back in 1990, I picked up a copy that introduced him, which was uh, New Warriors number one. And Night Thrasher was eh, not a terribly interesting concept. Uh, he's... Uh, his origin and such, his little blurb is put up at the top of uh, 2024's Night Thrasher number one, and I've reprinted it down here so you can see it. After his parents were murdered, Dwayne Taylor dedicated himself to fighting crime. Dwayne used his inherited wealth to run the Taylor Foundation while also secretly training to become an expert combatant and or combatant and armored vigilante. Well, does that sound like anybody we know? Yes, that's basically the origin of Batman. Except this Batman has a skateboard. That's why he's called Night Thrasher. Thrashing is another word for using cool skateboard techniques. And he has that skateboard to this day, as the Black History variant uh, of uh, the Night Thrasher number one cover from this year shows. I don't know what makes this a Black History Month variant other than he's a black character, but okay. So let's see what happens in Night Thrasher number one. Well, we start off with Dwayne returning to New York City, and uh, he goes to the funeral of his mentor, Cord, and that's his uh, Cord's daughter giving the eulogy there. And while he's in town, he decides he's going to shut down the Taylor Foundation. He's tired of uh, dealing with the city's problems, and so he's going to uh, head on out and, I guess, find greener pastures. Now, there is a sad typo on here. Father Michael should be uh, Father Michael without a comma in between. Uh, it looks like every once in a while Marvel has a typo, too, which is sad. But while Dwayne Turner is in New York, he encounters a gang of little street thugs. These are all, like, minor children for the most part, uh, some of them with barely stubbly beards. And uh, they go and they commit a smash-and-grab robbery, like the kind you see on the news sometimes, where uh, they do a flash mob of sorts. And he gets into a one-on-one -on -one fight with one of the kids and realizes that the kid's fighting technique is just like his. And so he gets back into his Night Thrasher outfit and heads toward the sewer, tracking down the kids, and uh, finds that uh, he's, he's philosophizing about his hero life and saying, you know, this is where the kids ran. I wanted to put all this behind me, but here I am. Maybe this is all I am. If I can give Harlem some peace, maybe I can find some of my own. So he's thinking about, uh, you know, at this point, contemplating returning to Harlem and actually taking up the superhero business again. And maybe that will bring some peace to himself. Now, he encounters one of his old prodigies called Rage. Uh, first name, Elvin. Don't know his last name. But this is a very, very strong and durable guy and he beats the living hell out of uh, Night Thrasher and leaves him to basically, you know, soak, soak the uh, ground with his blood and uh, just walks away. Night Thrasher contemplates giving up, but uh, he says, no, I'm, I'm going to stay. I'm going to see this through. I'm going to fix it. So he's returning to his heroism. And sure enough, he will be encountering Rage again in uh, Night Thrasher number two. Now, if any of this sounds familiar to you, it's because it's basically the plot of Isom number one. In fact, there's almost a one-to-one -one correspondence between the events of Night Thrasher number one and the events of Isom number one. So the parallels are pretty obvious. You've got Dwayne Taylor returning to New York for the funeral of an old family friend, whereas in Isom number one, Avery Silman returns to Flores Park as a favor to an old flat family friend. That would be uh, Jasmine's mom. Uh, Mrs. Newman. 
While in New York, Dwayne gets mixed up in some criminal business, and while in Flores Park, Avery gets mixed up in some criminal business. Dwayne encounters Rage, a superpowered old acquaintance who flattens him. Avery encounters Santuan, a superpowered old acquaintance who flattens him. And then Dwayne determines to face Rage again, and Avery determines to face Santuan again. So, I mean, basically, this is the same book in terms of the events that happen in Night Thrasher 1 and Isom number 1. But here's where the difference is. It's in the motivations of the characters. You've got Dwayne Taylor returning to New York voluntarily to pay his respects, whereas Avery Silman is returning to Flores Park grudgingly from a sense of obligation to his sister, to his mother, to Mrs. Newman. You know, he doesn't really want to go. He's not really looking to return back to the hero business. Dwayne realizes he's partly responsible for the criminal business in New York, whereas Avery really doesn't care about any criminal business, just his own business, even though he kind of left his, uh, his friend Darren behind, so you know, who knows uh, if Avery's responsible in any particular way for Darren's uh, rise to power. Uh, all we know is that Avery just wants to get his job done of trying to find Mrs. Newman's daughter and just go home after that. Now, Rage beats down Dwayne, partly because he's angry that Dwayne left. That's one of the reasons there. Of course, Dwayne's also trying to stop Rage's criminal enterprise. But at the same time, uh, you've got Rage kind of upset that, you know, Dwayne was a hero in Harlem and he left. And, you know, what right does he have to judge where Rage went from there? Now, Santuan beats down Avery because that's just what he's paid to do. And he, he doesn't necessarily harbor a particular grudge, he just wants to get his money. And lastly, Dwayne won't run because he's a hero, and he, generally, he genuinely wants to help. He's going to finish what he started, he's going to uh, right the wrongs that he left behind. Now, Avery won't run because he's angry about having been disrespected. You know, Santuan gave him a beatdown, Santuan's boss, Darren... Uh, said a lot of mean things to him, and so he's pissed off at both of them, and he just wants to knock them both on their ass. So uh, so this is basically a, a totally different set of motivations between Night Thrasher number one and Isom number one. So you got to ask the question now, is Night Thrasher number one a hundred times better than Isom number one? And I don't see any room to say that that's necessarily true. Certainly not a hundred times better, but you know, I, I can't even say that one story is better than the other, because when the difference is the motivations, then you have to ask yourself, which motivations do you prefer? And that's what's going to make the story seem better or worse to you. Now, if you prefer, as people like Dick Masterson, as people like Ethan Van Skyver and whoever, you know, said this thing about uh, Night Thrasher and Isom number one to begin with, if you prefer the general heroic tropes of finding out that, okay, you have a responsibility to the city and, uh, you know, you left some people behind and because you abandoned them, then you have a responsibility to go and fix things now and it is your heroic impulse that drives you into the fray, well, then you're probably going to prefer the Night Thrasher number one story. But what if you prefer motivations that are a little bit closer to the real world? What if the reason you're returning is because you have to, not because you want to? What if the, uh, the, the, the criminal business that's around you really has nothing to do with you, and so it's not really your problem to solve until it ensnares you? And then what if the people who are against you are just against you because that's their job, as opposed to, you know, there's some kind of uh, vendetta from the past that's raising its ugly head? And lastly, what if, your, what if your motivations for staying in the fight don't have anything to do with heroism, but rather it's just a function of your own personality that, you know, you don't want to just take a beat down and, and slink off. Those are, those are much more real world type motivations than you'll find in a comic book. Not everybody has an Uncle Ben whose death they were responsible for. Not everybody's parents... We're, uh, we're shot and killed, and that's why you fight crime. I mean, there, there's, there's so many other different, more real-world motivations, and it, 
to some people, like myself, it's much more interesting to find a set of characters who are engaged in those kinds of real-world type stories than the standard hero tropes that have been done to death year after year. I mean, you know, Night Thrasher number one is not a bad story, but I have no interest in seeing the second issue. And the reason I have no interest is because I've seen this whole story play out with the same kind of motivations, etc., etc., a thousand times before. I'm a longtime comic book reader, and I want something different. You know, I saw number one kind of gives me that difference there. So, in my opinion, I don't see Night Thrasher number one as necessarily the better story, unless you're like a newbie on the, on the comic book scene. And if, if you're somebody who's a long-time reader, I'm, I'm not sure I can recommend it, because I know it's going to be done to death so far as you're concerned. So, my preference in the Night Thrasher versus Isom stories is actually lying with Isom number one. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily a better book because it's got so many technical flaws. And, you know, that's why I focus on the technical flaws as opposed to the greater themes of the story, including the motivations. You know, some people criticize me because I focus on things like, you know, that comma being in the wrong place. But that's something that's right or wrong, you know, depending on objective rules. And there are other rules that may seem more subjective. I don't find them to be. But having to do with art choices, writing choices, lettering choices, coloring choices, stylistic choices that can be good or bad depending on how well they're executed and how well the, the artist and the writers and everybody else involved make sure that the reader doesn't get confused when dealing with the story. You know, I didn't feel any confusion going through Night Thrasher, number one, when I was just reading through the book, with the exception of that Father, comma, Michael business that stood out to me. Uh, I didn't really go over most of it with a critical eye, other than to, to say some of the art just seemed a little bit on the light side. It didn't seem like it was uh, highly detailed in some places where you know, some detail work uh, could have been appreciated. But by and large, I'm looking at uh, the two stories as being essentially the same story, just with a different set of motivations. And I find the motivations of Isom more interesting, but I find the technical execu uh, the execution uh, of Night Thresher overall to be much more professional in that you don't have all of the mistakes that you would see that you see made in ISOM number one, when it comes to art, when it comes to writing choices, when it comes to coloring, when it comes to lettering, you don't see all the mistake, the, the little mistakes made that make ISOM hard to read. You know, Night Thrasher, on the other hand, was easy to read, but it also didn't have as much as, as interesting a story. So that's why I, I basically stay away from trying to tell the writer what story he should write. You know, and that is the fault that I usually give to uh, EBS's criticism of ISOM number one and Dick Masterson's criticism of ISOM number one, is that they're, they're both largely telling him to write a different story. Oh, you know, you shouldn't have the, the sister and the niece survive by the end of the book. You should have them blown up and then, and that'll be the charging moment that turns Avery around and blah, blah, blah. It's like, if that's the story you want to read, go write that story yourself. That's obviously not the story that, that Eric July wanted to write. So, you know, quit telling him to write another story. Quit telling him to write something that follows some sort of hero's formula that the rest of us have already seen a dozen times and don't really care to see again. I myself wanted to see a, a story about a reluctant hero who basically doesn't have the incentive or the drive to go back to the hero business because of something that happened traumatic in his past. And I wanted to see how that uh, how that could be overcome. And there, you know, I saw number one started the slow burn on that, and we're still in the middle of the burn, I guess, because I saw number two didn't really get us much farther beyond that portion. And I have no idea what I saw number three is going to do for us. So. In any case, that's my analysis of Night Thrasher versus Isom. I don't really find one book to be better than the other. I know that Night Thrasher number one was technically executed much better than Isom number one was, but Isom number one to me was the more interesting story. It introduced a more interesting set of characters and uh, gave them a more interesting set of motivations. And I, I would prefer to see where Isom number one goes as opposed to Night Thrasher number one goes, which is 
why I guess I was so freaking disappointed with ISOM number two, because we, we got such a scattershot mess for that. All right, so that is my analysis, and I uh, hope you enjoyed this uh, video. I'm Mike Partika. Thank you for watching. Please do subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, I will be getting back soon with uh, Andy Smith's Core Draft, The Reckoning, and after that I'll be getting back into Ethan Van Skyver's Cyber Frog 2 Wrecked Planet, and uh, we'll see how things go with both of those. And I've also got Shane Davis's Inglorious Rex and Starlight Cats on the way, and John Malin's Graveyard Shift. So I've got a lot of stuff to review, and, and I want to make sure that you get those notifications when those things come due. So please do subscribe, turn the notifications on if you like, and I will talk to you later.